She came to us as a teenage defector in 1975, and over the next two decades, we witnessed one of the most dramatic transformations in sports history. From chubby, lazy, and self-indulgent, she was sculpted into a model of physical strength, discipline, and dynamism. If she seemed self-assured on the court, there was a search for an identity going on inside her. She wanted to show off. Martina's a show off. I mean, she wants to show, this is what I can do with this body. This is what I can do with my mind. Martina would walk out on the court and she would know that she was in such far superior condition that the other player just didn't stand a chance. Neat and clean. She just carved people up, hit the serve, bingo, you know, with dispatch. There was a muscularity to her that made people uncomfortable. People at the time really acted as though there was something a little off about her physically. You know, all those muscles didn't seem quite right. And all of a sudden you start seeing women's sports is not just the girl next door. It's the, the athlete whose veins show in her legs. I think people thought of her as a villain because physically she was so strong. People were taken aback, and I think people were intimidated by this. Navratilova was so good at Wimbledon that there was an element that didn't want her to win again. What, nine Wimbledons? Jeez, I mean... So most people are lucky to play nine Wimbledons, let alone win them. That was her room. That was the green room, center court. And when she entered, why, she knew it was her place. If there was ever a surface that was tailor-made for a player, it was grass court for Martina. There is the queen of tennis in Wimbledon today. Raised in a village outside Prague, Martina was swinging a tennis racket by the time she was four years old. It had a wooden handle, no leather, and it was huge, so I had to hold it with two hands because I couldn't even get my hand around it. And my favorite drill was to have somebody hit the ball as hard as they could at me from the net and see if I could get it back. The first thing she learned when she grew up was the volley. I mean, most kids are way back on the baseline, and all, they, all Martina wanted to do was go forward, advance, advance, attack, attack. But Martina would go nowhere, do nothing without permission from the Soviet-controlled Czechoslovakian state. No detail, no matter how small, escaped the eye of Big Brother. Trainers and doctors would come into schools and gymnasiums and put calipers on people's calves to see how big they were going to grow. They would have clubs and they would have private coaches for their best young players. Martina was still a child when the government ordered her parents to share their home with another family. By 1968, the Czechs had hit back at Moscow control passing a series of political referenda intended to pave the way for democracy. Czechoslovakia was a place that was held up in the world's eyes as being under the thumb of the USSR. Anybody who could would have wanted to leave. They could get the voice of America. The Communist Party could not block them out from reality quite as well as it could in other parts of the Iron Curtain. So I think swirling around the Czechs as she grew up was this understanding of what's just beyond the wall and I think she grew up wanting a taste of it. The walls grew ever higher when the revolution known as Prague Spring was crushed by Soviet troops. In the fallout the Czech spirit was severely damaged. They thought they were going to have freedom and then to have it dashed so cruelly within a few months they went into a sense of depression. There were just holes everywhere from the treads, and it was just depressing to see that, you know, the countryside being ruined by these freaking tanks that came out of nowhere. They were living in a police state, and if you were an eminent athlete, you want to compete internationally and measure yourself against world-class abilities, and that was very difficult to do out of Czechoslovakia. The communists were sort of like a fisherman, and every now and then they would reel them in and you'd cast them out again and say, okay, you can go to Wimbledon if you behave. Even after reaching the French Open finals in 1975, 18-year-old Martina found herself pleading for permission to compete in the U.S. Open. They said I was too Americanized and socialized too much with the American players. I talked to my father and I said, oh, you know, I think I want to stay there. And he said, I was going to tell you the same thing. But if you do, don't come back no matter what I tell you on the phone because, uh, you know, we may 
have a gun to our head when we talk to you on the phone and or they'll certainly be listening to what I tell you. He said, just go and don't come back and don't tell your mother. After losing to Everett in the semifinals, Martina told U.S. officials she wanted to stay in America. The guy said, do not tell anybody anything. Just go to your hotel room. Don't say anything to anybody. You know, this is all very secretive. It was in the Washington Post that morning. You have never seen such a cacophony of people screaming and yelling, throwing sentences at her, and here she was answering in two languages. There's something very glamorous about defectors. She may not have felt very glamorous at that moment, hiding out in people's houses and scuttling around in taxi cabs and thinking that somebody would come and jab her with a needle and carry her on a plane. There was reason for paranoia for anybody from the Soviet bloc. My goal in my life is to become number one. You know, I want to play as much as I can and uh, when, I, when I want and where I want. And I didn't get this chance while being under the Czech government. At the same time that all this was going on, where she is about to desert her family, her nation, make this complete switch. She was also wrestling with who she was in sexual terms. But her whole life was based on this great will to win and to survive. Suddenly she'd gone from the gray of Czechoslovakia to this golden country of the United States. Sports Century's 50 Greatest Athletes is presented by Buick and your local Buick dealers. Isn't it time for a real car? Also brought to you by MCI 5 Cents Every Day. By MasterCard. There are some things money can't buy. For everything else, there's MasterCard. And by Burger King. When you have it your way, it just tastes better. Here she is, Martina Navratilova. just so embraced everything about this country and she just packed it on when you had a sandwich here in Czechoslovakia you had a thick piece of bread and a little bit of ham and there you had a thin slice of bread and you know this much ham so it was like wow I was in hog heaven well this is great for my seafood diet you have a seafood diet yeah I eat everything I can see so <laughs> well, she was an impulsive a uh, woman in her late teens who had just gotten a taste of money and fun and food and jewelry and cars and clothing. She had this one piece dancing on the tan line just going all over the place. I mean, everywhere. It was either white or it was tan. And she was eating a, a McDonald's cheeseburger and she had all this jewelry draped around her neck and her bracelets and rings and she was Americanized. She was a young American. She's about 20 pounds overweight, and she can't last in a three-set match, and she has the prospect of being the best in her field, and she's not even trained to do it. When she'd get a bad call, it would just, you know, go all over her. How could anyone make a mistake? The ball was out. She cared about every shot. She punished herself when she didn't execute. I displayed my emotions on a silver platter to everyone, and sometimes I didn't know what was going on on the inside, but the outside was very obvious. I felt like if I could just keep her out there, and she'd get frustrated, and she'd start to break down, and sure enough, she, she would. Martina did break down, losing 14 of 17 matches to Everett. But the emigre liked the American, and together, they won the 1976 Wimbledon doubles. They were good friends to the point that as teenagers, they actually went on a double date together with Dino Martin and Desi Arnaz Jr., the four of them went to a drive-in movie together. Martina's personality was that she wanted everyone to like her. She desperately wanted to be liked. And I can see her wanting Chrissy to like her. Chrissy is the queen of tennis. Martina also knew that to be number one, she would have to unseat her American friend, which she did in 1978, beating Chrissy for the first of back-to-back -back Wimbledon titles. But Martina was unable to stay on top. Enter basketball star Nancy Lieberman. Nancy Lieberman, when she started helping me in uh, the summer of 81, her biggest hope was that she made me realize I was wasting my talent. Martina would start playing hoops with Nancy, and within a couple minutes, she's sucking wind. Sucking, just coughing up her lungs. In my sincere, naive honesty, I said, I can't believe this is how you train. I mean, 
you're supposed to be really good and you really don't work at what you do. In comes Nancy, the drill instructor, to be the bad cop, to be the 800-pound gorilla. It came naturally for her to come up and just browbeat Martina and say, outside, teeny, we're going to work out. And she was, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that. See, I was persistent. She was resisting persistence. And she's crying, and people are jogging by us looking at me like I was Tilla the Han. Martina is driven by ego. It is a powerful, supremely consumptive ego. And if she decided that the way to make a mark on the history of the sport was to pursue conditioning, she was going to condition herself like no other woman athlete of her time. We did raise the standards and the fitness level of women's tennis or women's athletics because it took such a high-profile athlete like Martina to say to other people, it's not just good enough to play your sport. You have to do the other things to be a great athlete. Nancy Lieberman did a lot with her as far as, as whipping her into shape. As far as our relationship, it really went down the tubes there for a while because of Nancy's influence. I tried to explain to Martina, I mean, when you play tennis against Chris, it's war for her and tennis for you. She wants to take your trophies, your money, your place in history. I did imagine Chris as the enemy when I was practicing, when I was doing all those workouts. I clip things and post them uh, in the bathroom, on the mirrors. So every time Martina brushes her teeth, hey, this is what Chris said about you. This is your best friend. At certain times, Martina and Nancy would look over at me and just start laughing. This is kind of mean. Martina walks by and doesn't look at her, doesn't talk to her, and Chris can't understand it. So in 1982, I remember sitting in Wimbledon at a practice court, talking with Nancy in the stands while practice was going on. And all of a sudden, tennis balls come flying up into the stands. and. I looked down and there's Chris whacking balls at Nancy. And that whole thing totally changed what Martina was able to do on the court. And, and it really helped her to become a champion. I mean, she would win matches in 40 minutes. She would decide championships under an hour. Under Lieberman in 1982, Martina began a 156-week stay at the number one spot. Meanwhile, she reversed roles with Everett beating her in 28 of their last 36 matches. Martina was finally winning at the American game, but the question remained, was America ready for all of Martina? As Martina awaited the day she would become a U.S. citizen, she privately explored the territory beyond the borders of social freedom. In her wildest imaginings, she couldn't believe that people would mistreat her because she was a lesbian, because that was un-American in her mind. And I really felt America was the land of opportunity, the land of dreams, the land of where you can be who you are, and, and you don't have to make any apologies. It was very hard for her to know her sexual orientation and to, to know that it was not popular, it was not time, it would cost her money, it would cost her friends, it would cost her appeal, and that she couldn't afford to be who she was. Fearing the truth would delay her naturalization and hurt the women's tennis tour, Martina stayed in the closet in 1981. There was this reporter that was hounding me earlier that year, and I was feeling pressure to keep quiet. Once I got my citizenship, I said, I can't talk to you about it because it'll hurt the tour. The next day, the Daily News story is Navratilova admits her bisexuality will hurt the tour. Adding fuel to the media blaze, Martina moved in with Nancy Lieberman calling attention to the nature of their relationship. Nancy had come on as a trainer and a coach, and that she was going to, I believe the exact words were, lead her back to men. Now I'm in a relationship with Nancy Lieberman, who was in the closet in a big way, doesn't want anybody to know, so we sort of pretended that we were just friends, and uh, for me that was a low point, because I didn't want to do that, but uh, I did it to protect Nancy. Martina was uh, somebody in my life that was very positive. And, I mean, I can't really worry about what, you know, how people characterize my relationship with her. Uh, I don't hide anything. I don't deny anything. Despite the ongoing public scrutiny, Martina entered into a second phase of liberation. Being closeted is one of the debilitating experiences of any homosexual's life. There is nothing more difficult than living a lie. Once Martina didn't have to live a lie anymore, she was a new human being. Martina was the kind of person who um, would do better on the court because then she could forget all the terrible stuff that was invariably going on around her.
She went 128 and one over a period of about 17 months and the 74 match winning streak she had in 84 succeeded a 54 match winning streak she'd had in end of 83. With Pam Shriver, Martina dominated the doubles courts throughout the 1980s, winning 20 Grand Slam titles. And we just became this very intimidating tandem that people, when they walked out on the court, they weren't wondering whether or not they, they would win. They were wondering whether or not they would win games. Despite winning her sixth straight Grand Slam in 1984, Martina couldn't usurp Everett's position as America's princess. She was Miss America's pie, Chrissy Everett. Everybody loved her to knock her off was an act of heresy in this country. She's the picture of femininity, the picture of the American mother. Obviously, Martina Navratilova is, doesn't represent motherhood. She played feminine tennis, and I played masculine tennis. And she looked the part, and I looked the part. I can remember being at the US Open in the early 80s, watching a match between Chris and Martina where women with bracelets and you know, nice hair and good clothing would be standing up in the stands saying, come on, Chris, we want to see a real woman win. Martina looked, you know, looked like she was a lot bigger than Chrissy. But the fact is, it galled Martina that people didn't know that they both wore a size 8 skirt. The fact that she was perceived to be gay, where many of the other top female athletes were not, she's convinced that male editors went out of their way to find unflattering photographs of her. Martina's nationally publicized sexuality cost her millions in ancillary income. It's quite clear that the corporate world really responded to her more as a lesbian than as a great athlete. She missed out on making a lot of money. And I'm not talking about, you know, for rackets or balls. She wasn't getting those mainstream endorsements. And that's how it hurt her. Gabriella Sabatini won one major. And here's Gabriella with a perfume. And she had her, like, a Barbie doll, a Gabriella doll. All that kind of stuff that wasn't available to Martina. Madison Avenue didn't want to go near any of that. Even late, late, late in her career, her last couple of Wimbledons, they were still asking her, would you consider sort of putting a guy in your box so that it might help you financially? Martina refused to play a charade. When she won her ninth Wimbledon title in 1990, the person in the box was her companion of six years, Judy Nelson. It wasn't about gender it was about a commitment it was about saying i care about this person i love this person i want to spend my life with this person and i'm sure that a, a lot of people are watching who, who hadn't heard the rumors you know wondered what the heck was going on was this her mother her daughter her aunt her cousin it shocked lots of people you know people who knew what was going on were not were not shocked at all uh, and and were sort of uh, impressed by the boldness of it by the courage of it but that courage was tested a year later, when the couple split up. Suing Martina for half of her assets, Nelson cited a partnership agreement that had been captured on videotape, thus igniting still another media firestorm. You're not dumb, Martina. You're a smart lady. What did you think you were signing? What did you think you were agreeing to? I never thought we would split up. I thought that was the relationship that was going to last the rest of my life. But uh, I still didn't think that I would be given away. Uh, half of what I made. You had to know, even if you didn't know her well, you had to understand that this is a woman going through turmoil. What a shame. Why can't we just look at her as the athlete? Why must we bring this baggage and then tell her to carry it? I don't think she knew how to be a coward. You know, I don't think she knew how to hide. It just came out. And then she dealt with the consequences and, and you know, dealt with it, I think, probably fairly gracefully. Turn. After tennis, Martina finds new life at the barricades of social reform. Sports Century's 50 Greatest Athletes is presented by Buick and your local Buick dealers. Isn't it time for a real car? Also brought to you by Nike. By Budweiser. Now is the perfect time to enjoy a brewery fresh, Beechwood aged Budweiser. And by Lincoln Financial Group. Lincoln Financial Group clear solutions in a complex world. In 1994, Martina Nervatilova fell just short of her 10th Wimbledon singles title. But at 37, she stood on home ground at center court. She comes to one last Wimbledon that she shouldn't be there, probably shouldn't even been in the tournament, certainly shouldn't be in the final, but she's there just by force of will. She had transcended 
all the other labels by that time. And the only label that she had when she went on the center court for the final at Wimbledon was Warrior. As the audience at center court stands as one for this great champion. She's given us a lot to remember, hasn't she? She knew she wouldn't be back to center court as a singles player, and so she stopped. And uh, for anybody else, I suppose it would be sacrilegious, but she grabbed a chunk of the sod, and that was part of her heart, that grass court at Wimbledon. But despite equaling Chrissy's 18 Grand Slam singles titles, Martina's image in America remains second to her friend. I think it's a continuing frustration for Martina that for so long people said she's the greatest player who ever lived. Well, why weren't they copying her? Shouldn't there be hundreds and hundreds of little girls trying to play like Martina? They all try to play like Chris. Over 22 years, Martina won 167 singles titles, more than any other man or woman, enriching her reputation as the best in her game. But it's her legacy off the court that's important to her now. She understands from the get-go that she's here not to be an everyday run-of-the-mill personality. She's a band leader of some sort or another. Well, I went back with her in 1990 after the Velvet Revolution, and, and that was so stirring. The president, Vaslav Havel, invited her to speak on the six-month anniversary of the revolution. And Martina Navratilova, to my knowledge, is the only athlete who ever went to a gay and lesbian march on Washington and took that microphone and said, this is who I am. Martina Navratilova, the lesbian tennis player. They don't write Joe Montana, the heterosexual football player, do they? I don't feel as American as I would like to because I'm not allowed to feel like an American. I can't fight for the country. I can't adopt a child. You know, trying to teach in a public school. Martina's fierce belief in the freedom of speech is no less American than the Harley she received upon her retirement. Both reflect a life far different than the one that a scared, chubby girl left behind two decades earlier. By the power of her ability, by the power of her personality, she's forced us to accept her. If she feels unaccepted, that's a comment on us. I think honesty brings no regrets, but it certainly can make life more complicated, but that's the only way I know how to live. In the end, she played not only to win, but to demonstrate and celebrate what and who she had become. The what is the best woman tennis player of all time. As for the who, a free individual who helped a nation face a controversial social reality. Martina Navratilova proved she is all things American. For Sports Century's 50 Greatest Athletes, I'm Dan Patrick. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For more, log on to ESPN.com, a part of the GOAT.